receive our offering right now because I don't ever want anybody to think that we're doing some arm twisting or some pulling or anything like that. Um, but I had something that God just put in my heart this morning. Um, and I believe it's for somebody. If not, it's at least for me, but I believe it's for everybody that's willing to receive. So is everybody ready to receive this morning? Is anybody expecting this morning? You know, the Bible says that my expectation comes from him. So basically, he's putting it out there. All you have to do is choose to expect, choose to receive, okay? Amen? So if you want to give by um, the old school way, by envelope, there's envelopes and the seats in front of you. If you need one, the ushers will gladly serve you. But if you want to give by text or give online, you can text the word GIVE to 918-302-2488. Follow the prompts and... Uh, you can, it makes it super easy. So, or you can get online, whichever. But Psalms 115 says this. This is God speaking to you and to me. Say, God's talking to me. So it says this. Psalms 115, verses 14. It says, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. God's a God of increase. A lot of people don't like to think about that. Like, well, you just want my money. No, this is God saying that he's going to increase you more and more, you and your children. All you have to do is say, I choose to receive it. Say, I'm increasing. Wouldn't you like to increase in your bank account? Somebody, I would. I mean, I'll take it. All right, so. Romans 5 says this. I'm going to read this to you. Romans 5. Get New Testament on you because you're like, well, that's Old Testament. I'm I'm in, I'm new and new te- new covenant. Check this out. This is Paul speaking by unction of the Holy Spirit. He goes, "There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles." Sounds like 2020, doesn't it? Sounds like some democratic crazy people. To me. Just, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just not kidding. Sorry, not sorry. Um, anyhow. We love everybody. Okay. So it says, we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us. And how that uh, patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy. See, it's about expectation. In alert expectancy, such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. See, God generously is pouring into your life. But see, in order to pour into your life, you have to sow something. God is a if-then God. So if you sow, then you reap, right? We talked about that last week, and I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. It, It says this. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And he says, Then it is, uh, will be seen as a matter of generosity, not under pressure, as something that you felt forced to do. He doesn't ever want to do that. We don't do arm twisting or anything like that. But here's what it says. Hilarious generosity is the title for this portion. It says, here's my point. A stingy sower will reap a meager harvest. But the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving all because God loves hilarious generosity. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything, every moment, and in every way he will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. Amen. 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 Now, now, here's what I want you to, to get this. It's a reason I read this, I read it last week, but the reason I w- wanted to read it to you this time is because there's something that is significant in the Greek. Here's what it says in the Greek right here. So the Greek word uh, for this everything, check this out. God supplies everything, right? right. He supplies everything. So the Greek word is epikoregio, which is used in Greek literature for someone who pays all the expenses 
for the drama or choir production plus more. How many like getting their needs met? How many like more? Right? <laughs> to where you can actually go out to eat afterwards or you can, after you pay that PSO bill and the ONG and all that stuff, you actually have a little more left over, right? What this is saying is that God is the uh, epicoragio, basically the orchestrator, the one who brings it all together for you. It says that he is the divine leader, choir director, orchestrating everything and providing all that is needed to bring forth the sound of his glory on the earth. That's in your finances. That's for your body. That's in your relationships, at your work, wherever it may be. God is able to do, according to Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask, hope, think, or dream. Amen? Amen? According to the glory in you. So all you have to do is you just sow seed towards whatever it is you're believing for. When you sow seed, what do you get back? This, whatever you sowed seed for. So whatever you're believing God for, sow seed into that. And watch God work in your life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, let's raise our offering up to the Lord. If you don't have an offering, you can raise your hand because we want you blessed. God says that the blessed person, everything they put their hand to prospers. Amen. I believe we, everybody in this place is blessed. So, Father, we thank you so much for your anointing. We thank you for your yoke-destroying, burden-removing power that's evident in our lives, in our finances, in our body, in our minds, in our relationships. And we thank you that we get to worship you. We get to honor you with our substance, with our tithe, with our first fruits. And as we do, we thank you that you give exceedingly abundantly above back unto us so we can be a better giver and so we can give more into your kingdom and that you would get the glory for it in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen, amen. well praise God you may go ahead and sow your seed give online whichever and while you're doing that I want to give you a few announcements real quick um, we are having Baptism Sundays, December 27th. Come on, somebody. You're like, man, what's that about? Well, we don't want to end this year out like, eh, well, it's over. We made it. <laughs> no, we want to end this year with a bang. Because here's what, here's what baptism is. Baptism is an outward declaration of an inward change. Whether you're rededicating your life, whether you've been born again for the first time, whether maybe you never have been baptized, we want to celebrate that with you publicly. You're going under one way, but you're coming up completely new. And so if you want to be a part of that, if you want to be baptized uh, Sunday, December 27th, you could uh, sign up outside at the Connect booth. There's a connection there. And we'll also put some things on social media for you as well. Also, next Sunday, everybody say, next Sunday ugly sweater Sunday I want to see who can wear the ugliest sweater let's get creative let's see what's going on let's have some fun with this holiday season in light of all the stupid COVIDness that the media is trying to push on us anyhow uh, that's all of our announcements for today we're going to go ahead and move on forward from there because I don't want to get off into a political tangent okay you guys ready for the word this morning yes. I'm ready for the word Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your anointing. We thank you for your burden-removing, yoke-destroying power. I ask that you would anoint my words today. Let that be not of me, but of you, Father. And I ask that ears are open to hear, eyes are open to receive, and hearts are open to be filled with your promise and your word. We thank you for burdens being removed, yokes being destroyed today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to read a scripture first, and then we're going to unpack this thing. We're going to talk about some things that God put on my heart. We're in blessed life. This is week six. This sounds a little hot, but that's okay, I guess. Um, but I want to read a scripture real quick. So if you're taking notes, you want to write this down, Matthew 7, verses 24 through 29. If you're not taking notes, you want to write this down, Matthew 7, 24 <laughs> through 29, okay? And this is Jesus talking, right? So Jesus says this, he goes, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine 
and does them. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as one of the scribes. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word this morning. Let it do the work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, God wants you to have a blessed life. Now, a blessed life, we think, you know, sometimes people think that it's just finances, but, you know, if you have a bazillion dollars in cancer, that's not a very blessed life because you're going to end, your life's going to end early. Or how about, you know, you might have a bazillion dollars, you might have a healthy body, but you have a horrible relationship, very toxic, or your marriage is horrible, or, or the relationship with your kids is horrible. That's not a blessed life. Blessed literally means empowered to prosper. Prosper means to advance. So a blessed life means that God has enabled or empowered you to advance in every area of your life. But see, it's up to you. You've got to be expecting something. So whatever it is that you're expecting, you're going to receive. So how many big expectors do we have this morning? Amen. So, so this scripture right here, it, it says some very significant things. It says that the person that hears the word, because we come to church on Sundays, and you watch YouTube, and, and you might watch four or five other churches throughout the week, and you're hearing it, and you're like, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then you hear it, oh, that's good, that's good, and it does something to you, and you might even get choked up and cry, or you might get excited and shout in your car, or whatever it may be. You may even write a note down on it. Like, man, that was so awesome. But you don't do it. You're not actually putting it into action in your life. It says you're like a foolish man. And the word foolish, I just wanted to look it up because a lot of times we, in our English vernacular, we get those words um, ignorant and foolish kind of mixed up. We think sometimes they mean the same thing. Well, that person's ignorant. Yeah, he's just a fool. It's not what it means at all. See, foolish means this. It means that you know better but you're still doing it. Here's what it literally means. The word foolish in the Greek is moros, where we get the word moron. You know, that moron. I told him 500 times that stupid moron. Right, we get, we get like that, and that's where we hear that, that slang, that word moros. Here's what it literally means, dull. This is in the Greek. Dull, stupid, blockhead. Now, I don't believe that there's any morons in this room, okay? Let me be very clear. No morons, no dull, no stupid people. See, ignorant means this. You never knew. You were ignorant of it. Like, I'm ignorant of quantum physics, I know a little bit about it, but when you get on another level of, on quantum physics, I'm ignorant. I don't know. I'm ignorant on how to fly a jet fighter plane. I'm ignorant. But foolish is you know, yet you still do. Kind of like your diet. Right? Yeah, I know I'm supposed to be eating good, but it's holiday season. I saw a post the other day that it said, you know, it's the day after Thanksgiving. I got to come up with about 27 more excuses on why I'm not starting my diet yet, right? Because we always make an excuse. We know better. We know what to do. But we're like, oh, it's Thanksgiving. I want to eat something. Oh, it's got a Christmas party. And then we got another one. And so what we do is really we're being foolish because we already know something, but we're not acting on it, Okay? So God wants us to have a blessed life. Say, I'm going to have a blessed life. Now, a blessed life means a winning life. Who in here likes to win? 
Some of y'all do. Most of you do. It's good for you other people. We'll pray for you later that you'll have a winning attitude and that you'll get the overcoming, you know, spirit of Jesus on the inside of you. <laughs> but I started, I started just being reminded of things. You know what's so cool about God is if you actually talk to him, he'll actually remind you of things and he'll actually tell you things that will help you for your future doesn't matter how much junk you've done in your past doesn't matter what you did yesterday the moment you ask him to forgive you boom correct direct connections made you've got clear communication now you got to work some things out you got to get some mental things out of the way you got to get some habits out of the way but he starts talking and so i'm talking with god this this week and asking him what do you want to say what's going on he goes hey remember Back in September, do you remember? It was the 21st day of September, actually. That's when Rosh Hashanah was. Can you believe that this year, 2020, the beginning of God's new year, the Jewish new year, was September 21st? Was that Earth, Wind, and Fire? Who was it that sang the song? I don't even know. Is that right? Oh, good. Good. I did it right. So, so literally, Earth, Wind, and Fire got it right one time for 2020. The 21st day of September. Now, this is God's new year. It's already 2021 in God's year, 5781. And so this decade of 5780 and 5781, it's a decade of difference. And if you look at the word, the, the number is 5781, because everything in Hebrew, the Aleph Bet, there's 22 letters in the Aleph Bet. That's their, their alphabet. There's 22 letters. Aleph. Bait, Dalet, Ched, and just goes on and on and on. Well, each one represents a number. And each that number represents a pictograph or a, a, some type of a symbol. And so they all mean something. It's not some kind of conspiracy theory. This is literally the way God set it up for the people so they would know what to expect and what is to come. And so this, this decade is literally a decade of difference. That's what it means, a decade of difference. And so you could be like, well, yeah, I don't know if I want it to be different, man. It's been pretty bad lately. I don't know, man. No, look at it with the eyes of faith. It's a decade of difference. Things are going to get better. Now, if you look at the, the, the words that are in there, the word for, uh, for this, this, this decade is pay, P-E-Y in Hebrew. And the P-E-Y in Hebrew, it looks like a mouth. And so it's a decade of the mouth. And what happened in March of 2020? What happened? Remember 5780 when it started was in September. In March, Five, six months later, what did the world try to do? Cover your mouth. You guys are good students, good students. Cover your mouth. Why? Because the enemy knows that if he can get you to shut up, he can have his way with you. Now, I'm not going to get super political, but I am going to get super biblical with you today. Okay, because you need to know some things. You need to be reminded of some things, and you need to be stirred up about some things. So 5781, the year of the mouth, the year of speaking, God established it. We need to be speaking some things. And if you didn't catch last week, get online and watch it. We talked about the enemy will use omission to keep you out of the blessings of God. It's what you allow him to do. It's what you just don't take authority over. Okay? So, 5, 7, 8, 1, it looks like this. 5 is to look, to see. The 7 is a plow or a weapon. Okay? You're plowing up maybe some old mindsets, some old ways of thinking, plowing through some old junk that you need to forgive and forget and move on. And then the 8 and the 1. The eight represents what it looks like is a fence in Hebrew, and that is separation. Do you not see a separation happening right now in America, much less the world? There's a separation happening. 
And the last one, the one that's Aleph, that looks like an ox. That means in the separation, you're going to find strength. So as you separate yourself unto God, you find strength. See, you can't separate from something and not separate to something. When you started your, 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 I keep going back to diets, but when you started like your little diet, you separated from eating Oreo balls or Popeye's chicken, the spicy sandwich, it's really good. Or the fries, the spicy fries are amazing. You separated from eating that and you started separating yourself unto chicken breast and rice and sweet potatoes and things that are healthier for you that are going to give you a longer life and a smaller waistline so you separate from one thing unto another you look at people with addictive personalities people that maybe have chemical dependencies alcohol drugs whatever and they they stop one thing and then they start over into something else well, I'm not, I'm not doing crack anymore, but I'm smoking 700 cigarettes a day, right? You go from one to another. Well, I'm not, I'm not on Facebook all the time, but I'm just gaming like crazy, right? You separate from one thing to another. It's in every aspect of your life. So God's asking you to separate from a certain way of thinking from a certain way of doing, from a certain way of believing, maybe separating from holding on to old things of your past. Maybe from separating what a teacher or a parent or a grandparent or aunt or uncle said about you that hurt you when you were a child. Separating from that and then separating yourself unto what God says about you. See, 2020, has it been crazy for anybody? I mean, it's been pretty cool for me. I mean, it's been amazing. Other than wearing masks and getting in fights with people, other than that, it's great. <laughs> Sir, can you please cover your nose? No, I can't. I can't. can't. Can't cover my nose. And so then, you know, you talk to them, and you're like, well, yeah, okay, I'll cover my nose. Cause you can't serve me, so I'll cover Okay, I'll cover my nose. And then I'll hand them money. I was like, you know that I just picked my nose when I handed you that debit card. No, you didn't. I didn't pick my nose. My wife said, but you know, he's just kind of honorary. But, but see, the thing, all the stuff that's happening right now is happening because the enemy wants to keep your hope down. He wants to keep you in a place of paralysis or a place of complacency or a place of imprisonment. And I'm here to get you out today. We're going to do a little coaching today. We're going to do a little training today, okay? That's what I like to do. But it's not going to be my opinion. It's going to be this right here. Did you know this word of God here? Luke 1, I think it's 27 or 37. It says that no word from God will ever fail. No word. So if you need healing in your body, if you need financial peace, if you need a breakthrough, if you need something from an addiction or forgiveness, it's right here. It's right here. And see, what happens is we've walked in a light at one time, and we were fired up, and we were excited, and the word just like it stirred us up, and it made us just want to go and take over the world. But then something happened in your life, and you feel like God let you down. Or maybe even worse, you felt like, how could God love me? I knowingly did that wrong. Well, I'm here to tell you I was that guy in multiple situations. But the great thing is that his mercies are new every morning. Every morning. Every morning. So it doesn't matter what even happened to you yesterday or last night when you woke up this morning and you made it here in this room or you're watching online or you're going to watch this in a year on YouTube new mercy new freedom new hope it's time to, to wake up it's time to rise up 
As a matter of fact, my, my next scripture reference is this. Write this down. Even if you're not taking notes, write it down. Put it on your phone. Watch it over and over and over. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. I'm going to read this from the Amplified uh, because it needs to be amplified. It says this. It says, arise. Say, arise. arise. Now, come on, say it, guys. Like, we're a team. We're about to go into the championship game, and we are going to win. Our record is 11-0. and 0. Theirs is 7-7. Seven and seven. They got a 50% chance of winning, but we got 100%. So stay with me. Arise. arise. That's a little bit better. We're going to work on that. We're going to work on that. See, I wanted to rise up on the inside of you. It says, arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. 2020 has tried to keep you. Political agendas have tried to keep you. Nobody in this room is going to take that vaccine, by the way. We're not following their agenda. We're not following silly stuff like that. Okay, you can do whatever you want personally. I'm not taking the vaccine. I'll just say that. The enemy wants to keep you down, but here's what God says. Arise. Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Well, I got born again when I was born. I basically was born into a Christian family. I was praying in tongues by the time I was four. Well, good for you. It still says arise because life happens, right? I used to say this shift happens. Things shift in your lives, right? And your things, your things are going good, and then something shifts, and you're like, oh, shift, what happened? Right? <laughs> Life happens, and it jacks with you, but how you respond to it, if you get up, Sorry. I'm on point today. You better watch out. <laughs> you have responded. I responded. How you respond is going to set the mark to where you're going. Not only does it say rise to a new life, it says shine. It says be radiant. With the glory of the Lord. When you rise up, God rises up on the inside of you. Yes, yes. See, arise. It's not a suggestion. It's not a wish. From God, I sure wish you would rise up. No, arise in Hebrew is a command word. See, in Hebrew, there's certain words that are command words. Meaning this, when I give you a command word, it's like me going, hey, uh, uh, I need you, babe. I need you. I want you to go to um, Costco, even though they make you wear a mask. I want you to go to Costco, and I want you to buy everything in the store because I have an unlimited American Express carte blanche black card. Here you go. Praise the Lord. Wow. Praise the Lord. And I want you to get all the trips. They have trips. We're going to go to, to uh, Fiji later on this month after Christmas. And she's like, praise the Lord. It's a command word. I'm giving her a command, but the ability, I just gave her my wallet. I gave her what she needed to do what I've asked her to do. So when it says arise, it's a command word, and the word is kum. K-U-W-M. And see, here's the cool thing about God. Every command word reveals the heart of God. God never says anything in his word that does not reveal his heart. It's a command word. It's his heart. So God's heart for you, if you're in any type of a situation that's just, let's just say it's not even bad. Let's just say it's average. Has anybody had some average 
Maybe you're in an average place right now. Guess what? You still can arise from average. God doesn't create anybody to be average. So this command word, it literally means this, and this is, I wrote this down, I wanted to read it to you. This is the command word, and every command word reveals the heart of God. He's saying, rise up, stand up, arise in a hostile sense. What? God's hostile? Yes. One of his names is the Lord of Angel Armies. That means all the crap that's trying to bully you, Donnie Staten. <laughs> oh, you guys were here last week. A couple of you guys were here. Tries to bully you. Something in you needs to rise up in a hostile fashion and say, no more. No more. Because this is God's heart for you. He's like, I'm giving you the ability, I'm giving you the authority to crush this thing. All you got to do is arise. Say, I'm arising. Did you know that every major person in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God told to arise? I studied it out myself. Abraham, David, Moses, Joshua, Isaac. He said, arise, Genesis 13, 1. He just left Lot, and he says, hey, look up from where you are and look out. And then he goes on and tells them all the stuff that he's going to do for them, and then he goes, arise, now that you've separated yourself from something that I never told you to bring with you, 5781, separation, We're separating. So we can separate unto. God's telling the church, He's telling you, this is what I came to tell you this morning to arise. He's telling you to rise up to who He's created you to be. He's telling you to come up higher. When you come up higher, you see things from a different perspective. I can see things up here that I can't down there. See, we're going to stand up as a church, right? We're going to stand up as a body, and we're going to speak up for righteousness, yes, amen. for life, yes, amen. for what's right. Because, see, God wants us to have the conditions of heaven here on the earth. Literally, the prayer that the disciples, they go, Jesus, tell us, teach us how to pray. We don't care about the, the signs and the wonders as much because we know that comes from your relationship with your Father. So teach us how to pray. And so he goes, oh, sure, no problem. Here you go. Here's, here it is. Here's the key. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. That means your way of doing things come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So he's saying, bring the conditions of heaven here on the earth. What did Jesus do when he was here on the earth? He brought the conditions of heaven here on the earth. Amen. That's right. What did I just read? They were amazed at his authority because he actually did what he said. And he wasn't like the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, I want to read this to you in this one translation. The message translation says it like this. It's so good. So good. They never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying. Quite a contrast to their religion teachers. Jesus was living everything he was saying. He was bringing the conditions of heaven on the earth. And then he goes, all authority I'm giving to you. See, we always, we always like to do this. As a matter of fact, I see it so much here as a pastor. They're like, hey, pastor, will you pray for me? Well, sure. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be like this. Uh, my buddy over here, Stephen, uh, say, say he, he, he had a knee surgery or something. 
crazy. You never will. In Jesus' name. You know, healthy. Healthy. <laughs> but let's just say, for example, he goes, hey, I can't cut my grass. Can you cut my grass for me? Yeah, man, no problem. Where do you live? Okay, got it. Doom. There. And then I'm cutting his grass, cutting his grass. His knee gets better. He's actually squatting 600 pounds now, and he's doing all this stuff. But I'm still cutting his grass. There's going to come a point in time where like, hey, bro, um, can you cut your own grass now? Right? Wouldn't you think that way? Well, it's the same way in your relationship with God. You don't just come to the church. You know, that's where Catholics, I was raised Catholic, that's where they kind of mess some stuff up. Like, hey, we'll just go to the priest, ask him to say some prayers for you, and then go back and do your thing. See, you have the same authority that I do. Say, I have authority. I have authority. You have the very same authority that I do. We just have to have faith to walk it out. Right? right. So, so how do we arise? It's great that he's telling us this command. He's telling us to stand up. How do I arise? What do I do? How, how do I get off this addiction? How do I get off these medications? How do I get out of this negative thinking? What do I do? How do I arise? I'm glad you asked. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this. Some scriptures, almost all of them, are God-breathed. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Every scripture, every scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration and profitable for instruction. Profitable. Profitable. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration and profitable. Say it's profitable. It's profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error, and discipline. That's a dirty word in church. Discipline. What are you talking about? Just lay hands on me. <laughs> lay hands on me and then the money will come. Or lay hands on me and, and the demons will leave. And lay hands on me and I'll stop watching porn. Or, no, that is no. Discipline. Discipline in obedience and for training. In righteousness. What is that? In holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action. Good. That's separation, guys. That's separation. In holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, in intentionality, and in action. Remember what did Jesus just say? He said, the person that hears my word and does it is like the one built on a rock. Not going to sink. You know, one of my businesses is a construction company, and we went and did a site survey, did a soil testing. We had to go out there to this my friend's church that they're going to be building. We're starting it in the first of the year, and we had to do core samples. We had to dig down and make sure that that soil, that what was beneath what was seen was going to be able to support what we were going to build. You see, God's word, this word, will support whatever it is that's on your heart because God put it in your heart. How do we arise? Get that word on the inside of you. You know, a helium balloons, birthdays, you see them. Like nowadays, they have like these, our daughter's birthdays, like the 15 and the 17. You get a balloon like this big, and it costs $17 per balloon. And it's crazy. But you fill it up with helium, right? You fill it up with the breath. You fill it up with air. And that air, it causes what? The balloon to arise. See, what's on the inside of you is going to cause you to arise. You've got the breath. Remember, it says the word is the, the breath of God. It's inspired by God. And so you get this on the inside of you. It starts to rise up. It, 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 it's like right now. Like you knew that, that I wrestled and I played soccer. And so if someone were to come at me, I would automatically grab them. I would grab their elbow and I would put my hand underneath their armpit. And I would automatically pull like that. Ask my wife. She does it all the time. I throw her to the ground. I'm like, sorry, babe, sorry. 
She, we were playing around yesterday, actually. She goes, I'm going to get you. Oh, yeah? And I ran, and I jumped on the couch, and my automatic, my automatic wrestling mode kicked in, didn't even think about it, and elbow, my shoulder went straight into her face. She's like, oh, you cracked my nose. I'm like, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. It just happened. I was, I was playing. I was like, hey, baby. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, can't do that with girls. Found that out the hard way. Only took 23 years to figure it out. But see, the thing is, is it's ingrained in me. I don't have to think about it. If you were to, if, if, if a soccer ball was to be coming across this way, I would go boom, and I would trap it automatically, or I would shoulder pass it to someone else automatically, because I've been playing since I was four years old. Now I'm only 27. <laughs> now I'm supposed to lie in church, okay? So <laughs> we'll add some years to that. But see, it's ingrained in me. And what, is it, what does it happen when pressure comes? When something comes, I automatically rise up and do what I've been ingrained to do. You get the word so on the inside of you that it starts to just rise up on the inside of you. That's what we need right now, guys. This is how you can have a blessed life. This is how you can have a blessed Christmas What's on the inside of you? What rises up when pressure comes? Cuss words? Maybe. You taking the responsibility yourself? How am I going to fix this? What am I going to do? That's what guys do. Well, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to do that. I'm going I'm I'm to fix that. And then you end up messing it up and making it worse because you're not really an authority in that maybe area, right? See, let me tell you something. There, there's something that's been handed down from generation to generation within churches. And they just re, they, they repackage it. The enemy's doing this. And they, he repackages this. And, and now it's coined like this. You know, back then it was God's sovereign. He's got everything in control. He's going to do it all. Uh, and now it's, it's, they even make a song about it. Let go and let God. See, you guys know it. Let go and let God. Uh, Carrie Underwood, Jesus, take the wheel. Right? No. Then she talks about stabbing her boyfriend's tire later on. Like, <laughs> I don't understand. It makes no sense. <laughs> okay, Carrie. <laughs> Pastor Carrie. No, don't take advice from her. <laughs> totally lost my train of thought on that one. Ugh, get back, come back, come back, please. <laughs> but see, the thing is, is what we do is we're like, oh, well, God's going to take care of it. God's going to do it. Anybody hear that? God's about to do something. Let me tell you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burst your bubble right now. I'm going to burst your little religious bubble. God's not going to do anything anything else y'all are like man I don't like this church I'm going somewhere else where they build me up I'm about to here's why I say that Jesus already did everything that God needed him to do because when you say oh God I need you to do this he's like no 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 I'm not going to bring Jesus from the throne on my right hand, and I'm not going to put him back on the cross and re-crucify him and re-put sin on him and, and re-bury him and then re-resurrect him. That's not, no. He's already done everything he's going to do. So where does the responsibility lie now? On you and me. It's on us. See, we have the authority. You need to find out your authority. You need to find out your identity. That was my biggest struggle. I used to be the most insecure uh, baby that you had ever met. And I, I would, you know, cover it with short man syndrome and get as big as I am tall and lift a lot of weight and fight a bunch. And, and it was just total insecurity. Until I started finding myself in Scripture. That's what Jesus did. Now write these down. They're not going to be up on the screen, but write these down.
Paul tells us in Colossians to take our new identity in Christ. Now, Christ isn't his last name. That means the anointing, the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God for your life. And the whole purpose of the book of Colossians, check this out, guys. The whole reason Paul wrote the book of Colossians was to fend off false teachers. They were becoming mega. Like, oh, it's okay. You can, you can do anything you want. So here's the thing, guys. God wants all of you. I know there's a lot of guys in here, and guys by nature are extremely jealous. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, really? But let's just talk about girls for a second. Girls. <laughs> hey, girls. <laughs> let's just flip it real quick. Then we'll go back to the guys. Girls, if you're in a dating relationship or married, is it cool that your, your spouse or your boyfriend has, you know, an extra girlfriend, but they only meet up once in a while? No. She says no. Okay, she says no. Some of you guys are still on the fence. Okay. <laughs> is it okay that you meet with them once a month, that they meet up once a month? You know, it's just once. It's not that much. No, absolutely not. Guys, right now, I'm going to ask you, is it okay if your girl receives a text from a guy? Yeah, gun. He pulls out the gun. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> no. Is it cool if a girl, if your girl or your wife is somewhere alone with an old flame? Heck no. God put that nature inside of you. God is a jealous God. He wants all of you. Not part of you. Not just the Sunday, Wednesday you. He wants all of you. Because it says that you're his bride. <laughs> you're his, his wife. And it's weird as a guy to say that. <laughs> so weird. But something about it I like. I'm like, yeah, I'm his wife. Weird. But it's because he wants to protect you. He wants to, to, to cover you. He wants to envelop you with everything good about him. But you've got to know who you are in him. So Colossians I'll tell you a couple of scriptures. 2.20. It says, with Christ, that's the anointing, you died to the elemental spirits of the world. So you're dead to all that junk. You're dead to addiction. You're dead to old thinking. You're dead to oppression. Uh, it, back in the day, they would have labeled me ADHD, OCD, DD, da, da, do, da, da, da. <laughs> any, any initial, they would have put it on me. <laughs> they would have said, this boy's crazy. You need to give him a bunch of pills. <laughs> Slow his butt down. Sorry, mom, dad. Man, there's one time I just gotta tell you this. this one time. <laughs> so we would have slingshot fights with hunter slingshots. We had a crab apple tree in our backyard, and I was like, boom, hitting people, just you know, doing stuff. And so I'm all over the place. I'm running around. I'm shooting squirrels. I'm shooting my brother. I'm shooting everybody around me. And then they're shooting me, and we're getting whelps, and we got garbage can lids, and we're just doing everything we could do. And then I'd run over here and do this. We're never going to do that. And then one day, my brother and I were doing something, and I couldn't stay focused. And he got mad at me because I was all over the place. And he said, I'm going to say, get back over here. And he runs off, and I pick up a stick, and I just go, well, I was, remember, all over the place while well, he's walking up the steps of our back porch, and there's the house built in 1897, big old antebellum house, and there's this big, huge glass window, and it went, shatters, and all of a sudden, I hear, hey! I'm like, oh my God, I'm dead. I'm dead. My dad's head peeks through the window, and he's like, what are you doing? Why are you? I go, I meant to hit Andy. 
because I was so all over the place, I couldn't focus on one thing. I didn't think about a window. I didn't think about this. I just wanted to hit my brother. <laughs> Five minutes later, I was doing something else. But see, this word right here, it says that in the anointing, you died to the elemental spirits of the world. You're no longer bound by it. It's dead to you. Colossians 3.3 3 says that you died and your life is now hidden in the anointing in God. Colossians 3.1, you have been raised to a new life in Christ, the anointing. It says you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. That's 2.12. Colossians 3, 9 and 10, you've put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self and the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the anointing in you, the hope of glory means goodness, all the goodness of God, all good, anything good in you. That's a great Christmas right there. See, what I'm doing right now is I'm giving you a victor mentality, not a victim mentality. Because there's a lot of victim people out there in the church. I get it in the world, but in the church, you better not be no victim. Look, oh, I'm just scared they won't let me do nothing. <laughs> and you see what they're saying about me? And they said this is the church. And they said I can't go into Costco without a mask. Wah, wah, wah. Suck it up, buttercup. Be about it. Get the word in you to where none of this stuff moves you, and you can stand up for what you believe. Stand up for what the word says about your situation. Be a voice. I want every person there to have a victor mentality. See, a victim mentality is something that accepts labels. Like, ah, my arthritis. Why are you taking ownership of arthritis? Do you want to own it? Oh, my diabetes. Oh, you like diabetes? You like dying early? You like not being able to lose the weight? Or like, oh, my ADHD or, or oh, my, my CD. That's chemical dependency. Don't take ownership of it. That's a victim. That's a victim mentality. A victor mentality doesn't look at what they try to put on you. I was in a, a wrestling tournament in college, and, and I was in this bracket, this weight class, and, and I remember seeing all these guys, and they all run to the wall, and they look at the bracket to see who's seated where and what's seated what and who's that. And I was like, man, pfft, I don't care about that bracket. They just sat in a room and said, well, this is his record, and that's his record, and we'll put him here and him here. And da, 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 da. Who cares? You know what I did? I sat down on the side of the mat. I sat there and I watched. I was like, let me watch this guy. Okay. He's got a good takedown defense. Okay. So I'm going to have to do this. Oh, this guy, he's going to crank on me if he gets me down the ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be working my reversals. Oh, okay. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at my opponent just like the enemy will look at you and try to find your weaknesses. What you do as a victor is you get into the word and you find out where the strength is for the weakness that you have. See, I knew, I, was, I knew you weren't going to take me down. You may shoot in and get, get a leg, but I'm going to break your neck on the way. <laughs> I will. You will have a broken nose or cauliflower ear or your shoulder will be dislocated if you shoot in on me. That's how I was. That was just me because that's how I was trained. That's how I was taught. And then if we get down on the ground, guess what? You're going to pay. That's a victor mentality. Did I lose matches? Heck yeah, I did. Did I win matches? Heck yeah, I did. But see, I don't think about the times that I lost. I think about all the times that I won. What the victim does is they always think about the times that they didn't win, that they lost and what they couldn't do. See, that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to focus on, on, on what you don't have. On, on You can't have heaven here on the earth right now. That's for heaven. You don't need healing in heaven. 
You don't need money in heaven. That's a call to street. See, I'm trying to get your faith built up. Because Hebrews 11 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, confidently expected, the evidence of what you don't see as being real. That's a victor mentality. See, it says that you're going to have challenges, but you're going to overcome them all. Right? Right? Right. I'm not saying you won't. As a matter of fact, here's write these down. I'm giving you some stuff. I'm training you today, okay? We already did our offering, so we're going to get to leave as soon as I close this out, okay? 1 John 5, 4. For everyone born of God. If you're born of God, guess what? It says you overcome the world. Amen. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. There's victor mindset right there. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God. Remember, he talked to us about Thanksgiving. It operates the supernatural, opens up the supernatural for your life. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So if you're feeling overwhelmed or depressed, or don't know what to do, Psalms 3.3. 3. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me. The glory and the one who lifts my head high. See, I'm trying to cause you to arise. You're building your house on a rock. See, the one that hears it and does it experiences it. That's what we this encounter. Encounter God. When you encounter God, you can't deny it. You can't deny it. If I were to go talk to, to Stephen about something and, and he knew something more about it than I did because he experienced it, because he's done something that I haven't done, I can't talk him out of it. If I go to my wife, Dana, and say, babe, babe, uh, you don't know how to make that dessert. Let me show you how to do it. She'd be like, fool, go sit down. I run this kitchen. I know desserts. She may let me try and say, well, it's not bad. But I can't talk her out of something because she's experienced it. Yes. See, I want you to experience yes. victory. Experience yes. freedom that only comes from the anointing. So what would hinder us from walking in this victorious life? What would hinder us from walking in who God says we are? I'm going to tell you three things and we're going to close. Okay? Number one, offense. You get offended. And here's how you know you're offended when you go, oh, I'm not offended at all. <laughs> you're probably offended. No, man, I'm cool. No, I've got no problems. But when you think about it and it makes you, mm, or then you see them and you walk the other side of Walmart, <laughs> right? <clears throat> or you snooze them for 30 days on Facebook, <laughs> you're offended. And it says that if you're, Mark, Mark 11, 23 and 24, famous scripture, it says if any of you are offended or have unforgiveness in your heart, go to that person and get it right. Then you can go to your father. Then you can have this victorious, blessed life. So offense is the one thing that you really got to watch out for. You remember the, the story about the bait stick, about the monkeys and the bait stick? Did I tell you guys that story? I told one person, I'm going to tell the rest of y'all the rest of the story. So, so down in South America, um, this guy I know, Jim Richards, he was in Peru, but he's been all over the place down there. Um, <clears throat> they would get these monkeys because it's certain they're, they're it's gross, but the, these monkeys were like a delicacy and they brought a lot of money. And so they would get this cage with these spikes and the, the, they'd drop the spikes into the ground, super deep to where you couldn't move it, lift it, and a grown man, a couple of men couldn't get it out, and they would put this big shiny red stick inside this, this cage, and you could reach inside the cage, and you could grab it from any angle, and you'd grab that bait stick, it was shiny, and it was red, and it was beautiful, and the monkeys were just drawn to it, and they'd, they'd grab it, and they'd, ah, ah, and they couldn't, no matter which way they turned it, couldn't bend it, couldn't do anything to pull it out of the cage, and they literally would hold that 
stick for two days. They would not let go of it. And so what would happen? The hunters would come up, and, and as they would come up, that monkey would start screaming louder, ah, 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 jump up and down, ah, and they'd get a club, whoop, kill that monkey, whop it right in the head, boom, every time. They called it the bait stick. Offense is like a bait stick. All that monkey had to do was let go of it. Choose to forgive. Choose to let go of what happened to you or what they did or said about you or whatever it is. You got to choose to let go of it. Can you imagine... If that, let's just get cartoonish. Let's get in the monkey world for a second. Can you imagine if one monkey actually let go? Now, this has been happening for years and years and years. They still, to this day, do this. The, no monkey's gotten the revelation of letting go. <laughs> but can you imagine if this monkey let go of the bait stick and then he ran and he got away? He's like, yeah! And he goes to his monkey friends and he goes, guys, guys, I grabbed the stick. He goes, you grabbed the stick? You go, oh, yeah, I grabbed the stick. You grabbed the stick. I grabbed the stick. How did you get here? Everybody else will grab the stick. They don't come back. <laughs> I let go of it. What? You let go? Why did you let go? You don't let go. Nobody lets go. No, I let go, and they couldn't catch me. See, when you let go of offense, the enemy can't touch you. But what we do is we hold on to that bait stick and we go, in the name of Jesus, you get your hands off me, Satan. And he's blah, 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 blah. He's beating the snot out of you, but you're quoting scriptures, but they mean nothing because you've got offense in your heart. You got to let it go. Say, I'm letting go. Another one, comparison. It's normal in the world to compare. You know, that's why everybody is super influencers and they drive the cool cars and the big houses and they got you know stacks of money and they're on their phone with the big money and all that stuff and, and that's normal that's comparison you know the bible says something very specific about it it says that where comparisons and strife is is every evil work and so we get that in the world but see in the church in the church it's not that obvious like, well, you know, I, and I, I had to wrestle with it for a while. I compared all the time. God, you called me to do this. All my businesses were successful. This church isn't as successful like I think it should be. How come this guy over here, I know his dirt, but he's way better than I am. Or that guy over there, how come he doesn't even preach half as good as I do? <laughs> Comparison and pride. That's pride. That's pride. See, when you start comparing, you're opening the door wide open for the enemy to come in. Offense and comparison. Final thing, strife. Strife. This is what's going to keep you from having a blessed life, keep you, keep you from walking in the victory. Now, I'm going to close with this story. There's a guy by the name of Reinhard Bonnke, one of the great evangelists of our time, uh, moved on to heaven now. I mean, led millions and millions and millions to the Lord but not only that millions of supernatural miracles healings deliverance from demons all kinds of stuff all documented I've got a VHS that's how old the guy was I've got a VHS you know what that is kids it's a little black thing and it has tape in it and you put it in this thing and it so so VHS and I have this video and I was reminded of the video this one man was dead for two days in the morgue. His wife heard that Reinhard Bunke was coming to Africa. She stole his body out of the morgue, put him in a wheelbarrow, and wheelbarrowed his dead butt to the meeting. The ushers would not let her in, which I can imagine why. A little crazy. But because of her persistence, they finally allowed her into the basement of the building. And she still's like, I'm bringing him in on that stage. And Reinhard Bonnke, he's going to lay hands on him. And he's going to come back to life. My husband is promised to me. He's going to have life. Blah, 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 blah. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Finally, 
She convinced the ushers who worked for Reinhard Bonnke to lay hands on him. They laid hands on him, and he rose from the dead. They think, wow, what a cool story. They probably lived the happiest life the rest of their life, and everything was great, and he became a preacher. No. Went back home. About a month later, life happened. Shift happened. They got into an argument. That argument got heated and more heated. And they're in the room yelling at each other. Rah, rah, rah. He, <gasps> and he runs, locks himself in the bathroom door. And she's banging on the door. Let me in. You're going to finish this conversation. We're not done with this. Rah, rah, rah. You know how wives do. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. My wife does not do that. That's me. I'm banging on the door. Let me in. No, I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. So finally, she simmers down. He opens the door, comes out. She goes, what's the deal? He says, honey, honey, you don't understand. When I was dead, I was in hell. And I was tormented by demons. And the most vile, disgusting demon was a demon of strife. And he was in that room. And I was not going to let him in our house. That's why the word says that where comparison and strife is, is every evil work. So how do we walk in this authority? How do we walk in this identity? We get the offense out. We get the comparison out. We get the strife out. And we start speaking what God says about your situation. That's the separation. Start speaking what he says. And when you start speaking what he says, strength starts rising up. Strength starts coming in. See, what are you building your finances on? On 401k? Or are you building it on God? What are you building your family on, your health on? Let this word get in you to where it causes you to rise up. You build it on this, and he's going to come through every time in your life. Amen? Would you pray with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you that it's your word that does the work. It's your word that brings freedom. It's your word that brings liberty and light to us. And so right now, for every person in here, no matter who they are, young or old, I ask that you would give us an understanding, a revelation of who we are in you as we choose to forgive, we choose to let go, we choose to stop the comparison game and we choose to walk in love from this point forward our lives are changed and so father I thank you I thank you for your son Jesus that he died so we could live in fact let's pray that prayer together we don't ever do anything alone. It doesn't matter where you are, if you've been born again your whole life or you've never been born again. Let's pray this prayer together because this is the only thing that's truly going to bring change. Father God, I come to you now. And I repent. That means I turn from my thinking. I turn from my ways and I turn towards you. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Come into my heart. I give you free access. From this day forward, I'll never be the same again. And I give you praise and thanks for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, thank you so much for staying so long. And we went a few minutes over. But I wanted to get this to you because I want you to walk in victory. I want you to walk in the fullness of God. I want you to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And how is that going to happen? Get the word on the inside of you, who you are in him. You get that identity of who you are in him and let go of that offense. 
Let go of those things from the past. Don't let those things miss me. Don't start comparing yourself to other people. You just fix your focus on him and watch him work in your life. Amen. I love you guys. I call you blessed. I call you favored. We'll see you next week at 10 a.m. You are dismissed. Oh, yeah. And my wife says, we cover you in the blood of Jesus on the way home. Everybody drive safe. Don't do donuts until you get in your parking lot.